listening to Faith in 20, an out-of-the-box, grace-based ministry rooted in the great news of Jesus Christ. As with all God's children, I'm a competent minister of a new covenant, taught all things by the Holy Spirit. Have a question or two? Sick of the modern church model or just looking for context on scripture? Then I've got you covered, so stick around. Hey guys, welcome back to the show and welcome to the 50th episode of the Faith in 20 podcast. This is absolutely incredible that God has allowed this to happen. It's only been a few short months that we've been doing this. And I remember how cool it was the first time I even had one person listen to this. I definitely didn't expect anything out of it and certainly didn't see myself sitting here. So thank you for the continued support, the amazing questions and feedback. In keeping with typical Faith in 20 fashion, today's episode is just as weird as you'd expect. Is baptism spiritual warfare? And to clarify, we're talking about water baptism today, not baptism by fire and the Holy Spirit, which is, of course, what saves. As we get into this, I just ask you to do two things. Number one, put out of your mind any preconceived notions that you might have about whether water baptism saves. And number two, dump any definitions you currently hold about what spiritual warfare actually is, unless, of course, you're already familiar with the Divine Council worldview definition of spiritual warfare, in which case you're on the right track. What we're ultimately going to be talking about in this episode is how water baptism is related to the sin of the watchers or the sons of God from back in Genesis 6. But before we get there, we need to get a few things clear. As I mentioned, water baptism does not save. Salvation is by grace through faith apart from any of our own works. Ephesians 2, 4-9, John chapter 3, 17-18, and chapter 20, 30-31 if you need some references on that. Water baptism does not add anything to your salvation and it cannot take away sin. Have a look at Luke chapter 3 verse 16. John answered them all saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. This of course is the baptism that saves. Now, I don't want to spend too much time covering this ground about water baptism and what it is and isn't, because we have a lot to cover in terms of the spiritual warfare aspect. I covered the topic of baptism very early on in my podcast, episode four to be specific, titled Water Baptism, Duncan for an Extra Dose of Salvation. So please go and check that out if you have any questions about water baptism or want to dive deeper into the passages around baptism specifically because it's all there. Now, as you get into the context of the church, baptism has morphed into different forms and unfortunately many are incoherent and even completely divorced from scripture. Now, my goal isn't to critique these different forms, but just to lay them out for the listener's own knowledge. First, we have believer's baptism, which is the one that most of us from a non-reformed evangelical background are familiar with, and that is simply a complete immersion into water following a profession of faith. Now, baptismal regeneration is practiced in Catholic or other reform settings and holds to the belief that water baptism has the power to remove or forgive sin, a system obviously very divorced from what scripture says. This generally completes one's membership into a given church. Next is infant baptism or pedo-baptism, which holds to the belief that infants should be baptized before they are able to consciously believe. The thought is that infant baptism either removes original sin, in the case of Catholicism, or in non-reformed settings, ushers a child into church membership. Generally, churches who follow a believer's baptism system would not be subscribing to infant baptism, however, rather opting for perhaps infant dedication. Then there are differing forms of the act itself, complete immersion, which represents the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, triune immersion, which is very similar, only repeated three times for the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, sprinkling, and then pouring, which is like sprinkling, but of course a wetter experience, so choose your own adventure. (laughs) Some even argue, I know Lutherans have done this, that Paul's words in Colossians chapter 2, verses 10 to 12, suggests that water baptism should be viewed as the new covenant equivalent to circumcision. 
where it says, And you have been filled with him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Now, the tricky part with doing this is you'd have to use or speak about water baptism in all of the same ways that the Old Covenant circumcision was spoken of. And that's a pretty tall order. All right, on to the fun part here. Most of us with church backgrounds have been brought up with the idea that spiritual warfare involves the enemy or a demonic present causing some sort of oppression in your life because you're involving yourself with things that are contrary to God's will. Now, while I do believe that if you purposely go out and seek out certain avenues such as sorcery, witchcraft, psychics, etc., you might be asking for some tomfoolery to come into your life. Most of the time, though, this is blown way out of proportion and is completely incoherent with the true definition of spiritual warfare. I hope my listeners understand that the Holy Spirit will not occupy the same space as the enemy. Therefore, if you are reconciled to Christ, you cannot be possessed by a demonic spirit. Additionally, and we've talked about this before in the intro to the Divine Council series, this cartoonish idea of demons that charismatic churches hold on to does not accurately describe what's really going on. While I don't profess to be an expert in demon, I have chosen to believe that demons exist as the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim spoken about in Genesis 6-4 and Numbers 13-33. These beings have no proper dwelling since they are half human, half divine. They do not rightly belong in either realm and therefore remain on the earth. This is spoken about in detail in 1st Enoch 15-16. First Enoch chapter 15 verse 10 states, They shall be evil spirits on earth, and evil spirits shall they be called spirits of the evil ones. As for the spirits of heaven, in heaven shall be their dwelling. But as for the spirits of the earth which were born on the earth, on the earth shall be their dwelling. And the spirits of the giants afflict, oppress, destroy, attack, war, destroy, and cause trouble on the earth. We have discussed in great detail in the Divine Rebellion episodes that true spiritual warfare involved Yahweh versus the created gods who were supposed to rule justly over the disinherited nations allotted to them following the Genesis 11 Babel event, but they failed to do so. Spiritual warfare was declared by Jesus, who brought his disciples down to the base of Mount Hermon in Caesarea Philippi to make known that he is the Christ, the son of the living God, the physical place where 200 watchers descended long ago when they made a pact to sin against Yahweh and take wives of mankind for themselves, thus declaring war against their creator. Jesus was about to take back the nation and their nations and there's nothing they could do to stop it. This is spiritual warfare. Okay, so where the heck does water baptism fit in here? We're going to start with the foundation passage for this portion of the episode, which is 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 14 to 22. This is a passage that I've actually heard pastors avoid because it's simply too weird for them to interpret. Let that be a lesson to anyone who relies on a pastor for their biblical interpretation. Anywho, but even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy. Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ shall be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water.' 
Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. One thing is clear, and that is Peter is appealing to Christians to persevere as we undergo hardship. But he is, also, is he also suggesting that baptism is what saves us? We first have to become familiar with another definition, and that is typology. This is essentially a type of prophecy, an unspoken prophecy to be exact, which foreshadows something that is to come. The revelation of the prophecy isn't revealed until that thing happens, of course. Ezekiel is a great example of this. In chapter 5, verses 1 to 12, God had him do all kinds of weird things, and I'm sure a lot of people thought he was nuts, but it was all for a purpose. God told him to shave his head and beard, weigh it in the balances, burn a third of it, beat a third of it with a sword, scatter the last third to the wind to provide a visual portrayal of the future of Jerusalem. We only understand what was happening there because Ezekiel 5 tells us that this was a prophecy and what the fulfillment would be. The word typology is first identified in Romans chapter 5, 14, when Paul tells us that Adam was a typos or a kind mark type of Christ. Quote, Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. So Adam foreshadowed something about Jesus, in this case, the fact that sin had an effect on humanity. Adam is therefore the type, and Jesus is the echo of Adam, otherwise known as the anti-type. So, going back to 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 14 to 22, Peter uses the flood of Genesis 6 to 8, including the events of Genesis 6, 1 to 4, as a foreshadow of the gospel and resurrection. These events were celebrated during baptism. Now, let's unpack this a bit here. We're already familiar with the fact that in the books of 2 Peter and Jude, they both allude to material not in the canon of scripture, but in the book of 1 Enoch, precisely where each described the son of gods from Genesis 6, from the Genesis 6 event being held in chains in the abyss or Tartarus awaiting for their day of judgment. 2 Peter 2.4 states, for if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. And Jude 6 goes on to state, And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. So this narrative is outlined in 1 Enoch 6 to 15. For any of us vaguely familiar with Enoch's role beyond his disappearance briefly mentioned in Genesis, we know that Enoch acted as a human mediator between God and the Watchers. The Watchers requested that Enoch ask Yahweh to have mercy on them for their sins, to which Yahweh responds in 1 Enoch chapter 13 verses 1 to 3. And Enoch, go and say to Azel, you have no peace, you will have no peace, a great sentence has gone forth against you to bind you. You will have no relief or petition because of the unrighteous deeds that you have revealed and because of all the godless deeds and the unrighteousness and the sin that you revealed to men. Then I went and spoke to all of them together, and they were all afraid and trembling and fear seized them. So, no mercy for the divine beings, only the terrestrial ones. But how do we know that Peter was definitely referring to the spirits of the sons of God in Tartarus and not simply disembodied human spirits? Well, first off, the context of Peter associates these spirits specifically with the days of Noah. Let's first look at the vocabulary, vocabulary used in 1 Peter 3.19, where the word used for spirits is pneuma. This commonly refers to non-human spirits, whether it be angels or evil spirits. For example, Matthew 12, 43, Mark 1, 23, 26, 3, 30, 5, 2, chapter 8, 7, 25, Hebrews 1, 13, 1, 29, and Revelation 18, 2, just to name a few. It is the animating force or breath of a human being, and on one occasion, the disembodied spirit of a human, 
which is from Matthew 14, 26 and Luke 24, 37. So the word can be used for both non-human and maybe sometimes human dead. Now, in 1 Peter 3, 20, he talks about eight persons, the word psyche here, who were brought safely through water. Now, the term psyche is never used to describe non-human spirits, but speaks to the animating force of human life, such as mind, desires, emotions, departed soul, or spirit. So what we concluded then is that 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 19 to 20, is using vocabulary distinctive to each verse. It's more likely that Peter would have used psyche to describe the spirits in verse 19 had he had been talking about human spirits. Rather, he uses pneuma in verse 19, which is most commonly used for the non-human spirits. We also have to take note of the fact that these spirits are said to be in prison, or the word is phileiki here. This is very telling because there is no instance in either the New Testament or the book of Enoch where disembodied human spirits are said to be held in a prison. While some may render phileiki as sheol, this isn't a black and white translation, but simply an interpretation from later church tradition, particularly in the writings of Syriac from The Harrowing of Hell and is entirely non-biblical. First and second Enoch both describe the sons of God as being in prison, where they are condemned by God until they wait their day of judgment at the consummation of the age. Not to mention, this was the common understanding of a Jewish reader at the time of the Second Temple period, which in my opinion holds quite a bit more weight than later church tradition. So while 2 Peter 2.4 and Jude 6 both make mention of the imprisonment of the watchers, our odd little passage in 1 Peter also draws a parallel. Peter drew an analogy between the fallout of the Genesis 6 events with the gospel and the resurrection. The former event was a precursor for the latter. Just as Jesus became a new and better Adam, he was also a new and better Enoch in Peter's eyes. Just as Enoch descended into the abyss to confront the imprisoned watchers and share the bad news with them, 1 Peter chapter 3 verses 14 to 22 describes Jesus descending in the same way following his death on the cross. Jesus has more bad news to share with the imprisoned spirits who likely thought at that time that death had won since the Son of God had descended into their realm. Jesus shows up, however, to let them know, I might be here now, but I'm not staying here. So just so you know, you guys are still defeated. The plan worked. The powers that be were duped into killing the Son of God, and in doing so, death was defeated. As Jesus was resurrected to be seated at the right hand of God above all powers, angels, and authorities. So now, how do we correlate this with baptism specifically? Let's go over the most relevant part of this passage just one more time, and that is 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 to 22. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Now, we have to examine this passage through the lens of the Divine Council worldview. Keying in on verse 21 here, the word appeal is eparotima, which is commonly translated as a pledge, and conscience as sandesis. It's translated to an attitude or a decision indicative of one's loyalty. So we have a pledge and we have loyalty here. We know that baptism does not produce salvation, but it, quote, saves us in that it reflects a decision of the heart or a pledge of allegiance to Jesus. New Testament baptism was considered an oath of loyalty, a declaration of whose side you're on in this cosmic war of good and evil. Naturally, we are speaking about a believer's baptism here, not a reformed version which strays completely from the text. Additionally, this is a symbolic reminder to the fallen sons of God of their own demise— 
Early Christians understood this as a sort of typology and were quite comfortable linking this passage in 1 Peter back to the fallout of Genesis 6. Baptism was always considered spiritual warfare and also explains why in the early baptismal formulas they included a renunciation of Satan and his angels. So guys, as we wrap up this episode, as I said, this wasn't meant to act as a stance for why someone should be baptized or not. That is entirely a personal choice. This is simply offering a different viewpoint that isn't really ever discussed in light of the Divine Council worldview. And as I mentioned, please check out the earlier episode I did as it pertains directly to water baptism in the New Testament and speaks much more about how the church systems have become incoherent with what scripture says about baptism. And if you're watching this or listening to this on YouTube, I'll link that episode at the end of this one. Otherwise, it's episode four. All right, guys, thank you so much for joining me today. As always, if you have any questions, want to reach out, you know where to find me. Otherwise, I'll see you on the next one. Be blessed. Bye now. Thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of Faith in 20. If you'd like to learn more about the ministry, reach out at faithin20 at gmail.com, on Twitter or on Instagram at faithin20.ministry.